History Legends has returned back from the darkness. Hello my friends, I'm finally back in the headquarters. It was very funny to read all the rumors as to where I went. Perhaps I should do a video about it. As you can imagine, a lot of things have happened since I was abroad. So instead of doing a three hour long video, I'll do little chunks. Let's start with part one. In early September, Ukraine has won a resounding victory in Kharkiv Oblast. Militarily speaking, it was a masterpiece. It was quick and decisive. A true operational art. And in the end, the Russian army in Kharkiv was routed. Now I won't dwell too much in the day-to-day -day changes on the front line of the Kharkiv offensive. Many other channels did that brilliantly. But like I promised you, you guys deserve some girthy analysis where we'll explore how and why this offensive, this Ukrainian offensive was so successful. We'll look at all the details that most people have left out. What's interesting is that in mid-May, someone that you're probably very familiar with suggested that Ukraine should attack in the Balakleya sector because it was the best point to threaten Russian supply lines. Here, have a look. But I was always wondering why they did not attack in this sector as a push in this direction could be very lethal to the Russian supply line. I'll let you draw your own conclusions, but he may have said, why don't Ukrainians attack in this sector right here? I thought it was the weakest point in the Russian line of defense. And what did they do in September? They attacked right next to where I predicted, south of Balaklea to the west and from the north. It's literally the same area of operation. I remember everybody laughed at me, saying how ridiculous this idea was. I guess some people take my video seriously. Anyway, let's take a look at how the Ukrainians clapped the Russian army. Hello my friends and welcome to History Legends. I'm very happy to be finally back and to make these videos for you. Usually I would say that information changes by the hour, but in this case, I've had enough time to really think about what happened during this offensive. And stepping back from the conflict to Ukraine actually proved to be very helpful for me. If you're new to this channel, make sure to check out my Ukraine playlist so you don't miss anything I've said in the past. Make sure to check out my Patreon or PayPal to keep the show running. Thank you to everyone that has already helped and welcome to the headquarters. Russia says bye-bye to Kharkiv Oblast. Here's a front line on the night of September 6th to the 7th. And here the result after one week of fighting. And if we look at the situation today, not only did the Ukrainians push the Russians beyond the Oskol Reservoir, but the Russians simply withdrew. They fled from most of the region of Kharkiv. Compare that to my previous videos, remember? Russian gains at Bakhmut or Pesky, one kilometer here, 500 meters there. Pathetic peanuts. We've been talking about the same thing for two months. But again, it's not surprising. We've been talking about the problems of the Russian army and manpower for a long time. And eventually the hammer struck. Anyway, fact is, six months after the invasion, the Russian army has suffered its most decisive and staggering defeat yet. Even worse for them, Ukrainians are not done. They keep launching more and more attacks and are now that close to capture, to recapture Liman. There are four factors that explain this major Ukrainian victory. This video was made possible thanks to our sponsor, Surfshark. Surfshark is a VPN, an app and browser extension that lets you virtually place your phone, laptop, tablet or TV in any country. With Surfshark, no matter where you go in the world, you can take the internet from home with you. It got really handy when I was abroad in the past few weeks. From wherever in the world, I could still connect to a Canadian server and access the biggest movie catalog on Netflix. Netflix and chill, you know? And it's super, super easy. You just download it, set up an account, and get amazing deals when booking flights. Just like I did this entire month. I saved a lot of money because depending on where you book from, prices are not the same. Look, just try it out. It's very affordable, especially since you get 83% off and three months for free if you click my link in the description below and use the code history legends. Number one, hidden concentration. First of all, what troops do you use for such an offensive? Untrained and poorly equipped conscripts from the territorial defense? 
Maybe not, or at least not initially. You want Stoßtruppen, shock units, an elite corps de bataille. Or do like the Germans did during World War II with their Kampfgruppen. Told you I was gonna lose my English. Similarly, for this offensive, Ukraine regrouped units from three mechanized brigades. The 14th, the 92nd, and the 93rd. As well as the 80th and 85th air assault brigades. There was also the elite Kraken battalion and various special forces units. As you can see, big muscled units. And what makes these units elite is training, cohesion and high morale. The fact that they can withstand high casualties and keep pushing forward, which is essential if you want to achieve a breakthrough. Now, according to this video in the back, Ukrainians concentrated their strike force in this sector. How did Ukrainians manage to regroup all these units without the Russians knowing? How come the Russians, with all their satellites, surveillance equipment and even perhaps spies did not spot them like they supposedly managed to do in Kherson? Nobody talked about this particular point of the offensive. Everybody takes for granted that the Ukrainians were there and they just attacked and the Russians fled. Officially, Gime underline bold, officially, two days before the offensive, only the 3rd tank and 103rd territorial brigade was present in the sector. Yet units like the 92nd Mechanized Brigade was in Stai Saltif. The 93rd was south of Izium. The 80th Air Assault Brigade was just south of Sviatorsk. The 25th Air Assault was in Avdivka. And the 113th Territorial Defense was in Kozakaropan. How did the Russians not notice that these units would regroup there near Balakleya? Honestly, I thought about it for many days. My guess is that the Ukrainians confused the Russians by moving a lot of troops around back and forth. A bit like this Paspas sleight of hand game with the glasses, whose name I forgot in English. And I remember one night I just woke up and I was like, Perhaps they use civilian trucks to further improve this camouflage of moving troops around. Now, unlike the huge open terrain fields of southern Ukraine, when we go back to a satellite imagery of the place, you notice how there are some towns and villages west of Balakleya. If properly planned, you can easily hide ammo and vehicles in garages, hangars, or even on the ground. But most importantly, notice this huge forest to the south. Along the Siversky Donetsk River, with all the trees and leaves, you can easily hide thousands of men and hundreds of vehicles from satellites, especially if they have prepared dugouts with extra camouflage and covers. And my guess is that on the eve of the offensive, all these men simply drove to their assault positions. Overall, this huge aspect would be a perfect example of Maskirovka, deception. Now, such concentrations cannot go completely unnoticed. Interestingly enough, a lot of people on Russian Telegram channels have raised the alarm of a possible Ukrainian offensive as soon as August 7th, literally a month before the attack. And again, on these Russian Telegram channels, there were rumors just one week before the offensive that Ukrainians might prepare something in Kharkiv Oblast. Yet nothing was done. Just like their comrades in Kherson, Russian troops had all the time to prepare, build fortifications, set up minefields, set up hidden firing positions. Nothing. Why? What can explain all these shortcomings? And what I find interesting is that people often come up with simplistic answers, like the Russians were distracted by the Kherson offensive, or by the Vostok military drills in Eastern Russia. But to me, it's hard to believe Russia is not the eye of Sauron. You cannot just distract them. But it's the same question as to why Americans didn't notice the Chinese offensive in Korea in 1950, or how they did not anticipate the German offensive in the Ardennes in 1944. In all these situations, people did observe enemy movements, enemy concentration of forces, but somehow this information was not deemed critical by higher ups. Number two, choosing the right direction of strike. Once you have gathered your forces, in what direction do you throw them in battle? As you can see here, Kupiansk is the main logistic supply base for Russian troops in Izium. It's like Jenga, take out this piece and everything falls apart. Again, in this video in the back, you can notice how the Russian front line between Chuyiv and Balakleya was sparsely defended. For example, this Russian unit here covered a large front on its own. It was supposed to defend Balakleya from the west, but also from the south. Even worse, since this place was considered Calm. Russia placed second-rate units like the Rosgardia National Guard and Luhansk and Donetsk militiamen in this sector. And let's say that the militiamen from Donetsk and Luhansk 
were not really excited to fight in another province than their own. And there you have a full recipe for disaster. And I almost forgot, unlike in Kherson, Russians had barely any mobile reserves ready to intervene. There was only one line of defense and nothing after. When you take Balkleia and secure crossings over the Seversky Donetsk. And after that, it's only fields until the Oskol Reservoir. Number three, more than three to one attack defense ratio. Remember, Russia has more aircraft and more artillery than the Ukrainians. How did Ukraine manage to win with such a disadvantage? This is where local superiority becomes very important. And this was Napoleon's favorite battle tactic. Generally speaking, the attacker wants a 3 to 1 numerical advantage. But as you can see on the map, Ukrainians nearly had a 10 to 1 advantage at the strike point for maximum local superiority. Can you imagine 10 to 1? Not only was the attacking force more numerous, but elite. It's like if you come back from the club and you're a bit uh, drunk and you get jumped by 10 top tier MMA fighters. You won't even have the chance to lift a finger. Ukraine forces not only had local superiority in manpower, but also in vehicles. Ukrainians literally brought in all the remaining battle-ready reserves for this offensive. This elite corps de bataille was thrown into battle. As usual, they used a lot of Polish-made T-72s, but also many M113s. For example, Australia sent 28 units, and Denmark another 54 of the Danish version. Although these vehicles are relatively old, it's better for your infantry to be in these vehicles than walking on foot. At least it provides some protection and allows them to move very fast into enemy territory after a breakthrough. But clearly, Ukraine is actively using weapons sent from the West. Like I say in almost every video, without this help, it's hard to imagine how Ukraine could have been forming this armored strike group in the rear. Actually, that's the second one they managed to form. And now, not surprisingly, Ukraine wants Leopard 2s. Number 4. Suddenness Of course, this offensive had to be launched at once. There was no little offensives to shape the battlefield like in Kherson. You simply throw in all your dice and hope for the best. Ukrainian artillery started the show. We're talking M777, HIMARS and various artillery pieces. They fired a devastating artillery barrage on selected targets. For example, in the attack sector, they immediately took out all enemy command posts to deprive defenders from orders on what to do. And after that, with surprise and numerical superiority, with so many breakthroughs, the Russian defenders had no other choice but to flee. This picture is interesting. Not only do you see a lot of tanks, but the first one seems to be an anti-mine tank to open the path for all the ones behind. Fun fact, Ukrainians were trolling the Russians by also painting symbols on their armored vehicles. But anyway, on Russian telegram channels, they did not find these crosses funny at all. Honestly, I don't know. Do you think it's more similar to the symbols that German vehicles had during World War II? Or is it more like a reference to crusaders like Deus Vult, for example? Let me know in the comment section. What ended up happening? Now, all this planning is great, but execution is key. <laughs> that would be a great Soviet saying. If your men plan to retreat, execution is key. Like in Kherson, the attack on Balaklea was most likely planned by Nero. Whoops, spoiler alert, and executed by Ukrainians. But this time, according to some rumors, Nero or Western help solved a lot of coordination problems by literally micromanaging this battle allegedly from radio communication interceptions. Russians heard a lot of foreign languages, but at the same time, the Russians claimed that one in three soldiers of this offensive was from a NATO country. Perhaps the Russians were just salty to have been beaten by the Ukrainians. So they preferred to say, yeah, it was NATO. We, we lost because of NATO, <laughs> which is more acceptable in their eyes. But of course, all this narrative is to discredit the efforts made by the Ukrainian armed forces. But with that being said, it's not crazy to think that foreigners were involved in this battle, especially for technical weapons. There are rumors of Polish instructors on the ground for M777s and British officers manning the High Mars. And this foreign help has been boosted by a lot of videos circulating on Telegram, where you see British infantrymen, foreign volunteers, fighting side by side with Ukrainians. And here you can see a picture of Lithuanians that took part in this offensive. 
Don't forget that a lot of these elite units were trained, we know it, in Britain and elsewhere in Ukraine by foreign instructors. It's very possible that these foreign instructors joined them in battle. And if we continue down this path, it's very possible that a lot of the Ukraine units involved in this offensive reported to Western officers as well. Now here's a little summary of the Ukraine offensive. Early on September 7th, Ukraines launched a first strike on Balakleya, both from the west and the south. But instead of getting bogged down in an urban battle, Ukrainian armored vehicles bypassed strongholds and let the infantry behind mop up enemy positions. And it always amazes me how Ukrainians are able to build so many pontoon bridges so fast. You don't even have time to sneeze! The Ukrainians build a makeshift bridge and tanks are already passing by. I'm telling you, an army of beavers. Then, using their aquatic engineering skills, they pushed along this river and got behind Russian forces. And at the same time, two beefed up territorial brigades attacked at Shevchenko. After this initial success, Ukrainians took a lot of risks. They got bolder and bolder and started attacking in narrow corridors. It was dangerous, but it paid off. With the Ukrainians tailing them, the Russians soon got overwhelmed surrounded many Russian troops, allegedly surrendered or at least abandoned all their military equipment behind. Every day, Ukraine spear units would probe Russian defenses. Then they would pull back and at night, assault groups regrouped to storm the same place the next morning. Whoever executed this offensive... Wow. And just like that, Ukraine secured the towns of Yakovenkove, Volochivyar, and more importantly, Chevchenkove. Ukraine progression was so fast that Russians constantly failed to establish new lines of defenses. Every morning there would be another breakthrough. This operation made great use of two strengths of the Ukraine army, informational warfare and deep reconnaissance groups, very similar to commandos or rangers. Their task was to infiltrate Russian positions and they would be far ahead of the main Ukraine groupings and like that they would create panic behind enemy lines. They planted flags everywhere they went and posted them online. Sometimes there would only be a Ukraine squad taking a picture in front of the symbol of a city and the Russians would immediately think that the settlement has fallen. And the Russians saw this and thought that the enemy was already tens of kilometers behind them. This combination of armored strike groups and informational warfare worked brilliantly. Ukrainians then separated their strike groups in two in order to always push further and with one command ignore casualties. One group of about 11,000 men pushed from Chevchenkove towards Kupiansk. HIMARS also destroyed the bridge at this location to avoid Russian reinforcements from intervening. As for the second group, around 2,500 men and a lot of the commandos we talked about, they pushed south to cut communication lines between Izium and the Osko Reservoir. And if things couldn't get worse for the Russians, this sudden push was supported by another attack, another Ukrainian offensive towards Oskol. Once again, Ukrainians made great use of the force areas. They advanced undetected and struck at once. This put the Russian forces south of Izium in an operational encirclement. This offensive was perfectly orchestrated. The Russian front line in this sector was so empty of reserves that they had to bring reinforcements with M126 helicopters, meaning they came from very far away. That somewhat managed to stabilize the front line. But the Russians had no other choice but to withdraw to this Vatove, Liman line and behind the Oskol reservoir. Now during those days, Ukrainian telegram channels were popping champagne every hour. Every minute you would see a new picture of a liberated settlement. Now on the pro-Russian side, many thought that all this was planned an IQ-340 chess maneuver to trap the elite of the Ukrainian army. Nothing happened. Now it's true that the Russians bombarded, made great use of their artillery and aviation on Ukraine columns. But in the end, they kept pulling back their troops. All the vehicles left behind, the ammunition, the fuel, the prisoners. All this was probably part of the plan. And now the worst, the nail in the coffin, was when the Russian Ministry of Defense said that this withdrawal was in accordance of the special military operations. Like, come on! Anyway, Ukraine really hopes that Russia pulls more of these operations in accordance to the SMO. And in the past few weeks, Ukraine's even managed to do what the Russians struggled with for three months. Set up a pontoon bridge in front of Slavyansk, and, and now they're in front of Liman, almost encircling it. As of now, the Russians still hold the line, but for how long? And if the Ukrainians break through, it will be an unmitigated disaster for the Russians. Even worse 
than the previous military defeat. The Ukrainians will push straight into Luhansk. What now? If we take a step back, we can notice how for the Russians, Kharkiv Oblast was much less important than Kherson. They did not hesitate to withdraw all their troops from this entire region. And let's say that the Russian army in this sector managed to withdraw relatively unscattered. The Ukrainians claim to have destroyed or captured three brigades worth of military equipment. I don't even think there were three Russian brigades in that sector at full strength. On the other side, the Russians were coping by saying that yes, they did give up ground, but at least they inflicted a lot of casualties on the elite of the Ukraine army. There might be some truth to it. Allegedly, some residents in Kharkiv estimated that 1,200 wounded for September 8th and the 9th alone, which would mean that from September 7th to the 11th, we can say 2,500 wounded and 1,200 KA. For a total of 4,000 casualties for a strike force of 13,000, 27% in four days. And now if you don't believe Russian figures, it's completely fine. But officially, Ukraine claims that it's much beloved 93rd mechanized brigade only lost 50 wounded since the beginning of the war very very hard to believe as for equipment losses people put it at about 40 percent now even if casualties were that high ukraine achieved its objective i think that deserves a video on its own that's all i have for you today let me know in the comment section what you thought of my analysis if you're new to this channel don't forget to like and subscribe and if you want to support my work and keep the show running consider checking out my patreon and paypal